Good afternoon. Let me begin by expressing my gratitude, and I'm sure the uh, program committee, uh, to our speaker for his flexibility. Uh, he had agreed to be our Earth Day speaker on April 24th, but uh, due to some complications with the program today, uh, he was able and willing to step in. Jeremy Barnes recently retired after 42 years as an educator with particular interests in history and educational methodology. He was fortunate to teach on three continents, the highlight of which was as headmaster of a private multi-ethnic school in Johannesburg, South Africa toward the end of the apartheid uh, era. He discovered beekeeping by accident some 13 years ago, or as he sometimes says, the bees discovered him. And they became a passion, which has taken him to France four years ago and Kenya two years ago. He has recently served, it says six years, but I heard you say it might have been a little longer than that, uh, as president of the York County Beekeepers Association. He uh, slid me a note uh, and said, that he wanted to also uh, issue this invitation, and that is for those who are interested in the nuts and bolts of beekeeping, Jeremy has extended an open invitation to any Rotarian to spend time in his apiary in Seven Valleys and to get uh, questions uh, answered in detail. Jeremy's uh, standard email ends with identifying his hobby slash business slash passion. Uh, it reads, and, and remember, he was for uh, part of his life a, a, a subject of Her Majesty. Um, he uh, ends it with, uh, and also maybe a, a nod to Garrison Keillor, uh, his Meadowbrook apiary where the queen is strong, the drones are good looking, and the workers are all above average. <laughs> And at the risk of introducing someone who might, to the untrained ear, sound a little bit like Patty Rooney, <laughs> it is my pleasure to introduce Jeremy Barnes. Well, thank you, Steve. Good afternoon. It's been my experience in these after lunch talks. I notice that everyone's on the edge of their chairs waiting to hear three words. And when they hear those three words, they sit back and relax and enjoy the rest of the presentation. So it makes sense, I think, to start with those three words and then you can relax, right? So, finally, in conclusion. <laughs> when Steve invited me to be part of your political debate today, I thought initially that I would tell you that there are more than 50,000 species of bees. That number is more than the combined species of mammals and birds. And of those species, only one, the honeybee, is a, a sufficiently competent pollinator to make commercial agriculture possible. And we have developed in this country a commercial agri-business system that is almost totally reliant on honeybees when it comes to pollinating fruit and vegetables in particular. <clears throat> we normally lose about 30% of our bees every winter. And I would suggest to you that if we lost 30% of our dairy herd each winter, we'd have the um, National Guard out. This winter, we have lost in the region of 15% of our honeybees. That is a, a, a rate of loss that is unsustainable. At this rate of loss, the last honeybee colony in America will die in the year 2036. Getting my lunch from the buffet, I was just thinking what would be on the plate if there was no honeybee. All of the fruits began with a honeybee. All of those salads we had began with the honeybee, the potato, coffee, and even milk, because cattle are fed alfalfa in the winter, and alfalfa is pollinated by the honeybee. So your lunch would have consisted of corn, 
which is a grass and is wet pollinated, chicken and tuna. We'll give you a lunch today without the honeybee. I thought I'd tell you that one honeybee in her lifetime produces one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey. And when you buy a, a one pound jar of honey in the grocery store, that represents three million flowers and 54,000 piles flying by the bees to collect that nectar. More than twice around the earth. But I'm not going to tell you any of this today. <laughs> I want actually to, to paint a much bigger picture, a much larger canvas. I want to try and explain to you why, for me, the honeybee is our canary in the coal mine. And to do this, I need to go back a thousand years to the Middle Ages, because incidentally, the old medieval monks were great beekeepers. Um, they used honey and propolis in their, in their uh, medical facilities. They made beeswax candles because they burned without smoke, and so it didn't darken the inside of the great cathedrals. They used honey to make mead as a communion wine. And most importantly, they thought that we, what we call the queen bee was a king bee. And there was no sign of how he reproduced. There was something mystical, almost a kind of um, virgin birth, literally. And so there was a, the honeybee had a very spiritual significance for the Middle Ages. Because the Middle Ages were also an era of dogma and superstition, challenged first of all, of course, by the Renaissance, and then later, later by the Enlightenment. And with these two great movements came an emphasis on rationalism. This led to the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution, and our modern, our modern world. The intellectual authority of the scientific revolution was presented by giants like Galileo, Descartes, and Newton with their assertion that truth can be weighed and measured. Science replaced revelation as a source of knowledge. And with it came a new idea of a new world. The assumption was, and the assumption still is often, that the universe is a vast machine with interacting parts, much like a large clock. Each part can be viewed as separate and isolated. It has a few properties and movements determined by its mass and the forces acting on it. And in the event of a breakdown, the apparent solution is to identify the malfunctioning part and repair it. If we know how the parts work, then the world is not only predictable, but controllable. The universe is to be conquered and exploited. And in so doing, we have become increasingly detached from the natural world. We think, for example, that the honeybees can be controlled and manipulated, and if they are disappearing, and they are, we can fix it with just another combination of chemicals. One little fact I I'd like to share with you is that the new generation of pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides that we are presently using on the crops in your county is 7,000 times more toxic than EDT. And you know that we've, we've eaten it today for lunch, we are breathing it, it's in so the water we, we drink, it's omnipresent. So we can, yes, we can fix the bees with just another combination of chemicals. The same applies for the other things that are disappearing, whether insects, the bats, birds, fish, even the manatees of Florida are dying as a result of red tide, and red tide was caused by nitrates from Georgia leaking into the aquifer of Florida. <coughs> Clearly there are a few who supposedly can predict and control, a learned elite who determine this paradigm and I'm acutely aware that I'm speaking to some of them right now. Industry produces goods which need to be sold. So progress is measured in material terms, and a self-serving consumer society is lauded. We are encouraged to buy our way out of the depression, or shop our way out of the feelings that follow 9-11. So it's a very competitive culture. It rewards power and control. It promotes obedience and compliance. We are defined by our possessions, and particularly our houses, our clothes, and our vehicles. And ironically, although this new world, this scientific revolution, this industrial world, was expected to save mankind from the instabilities of the environment, to improve the quality of life, to enhance our freedoms, it has also engendered disability, 
It's condoned suffering. It's promoted divisions in society. We have a population explosion. We have urban gridlock. We have increased incidence of disease related to pollution and fast food diets. The obesity of, of a uh, couch potato society. Mental stress, depression caused by materialism. The imperialism of a monolithic agri agricultural business company. And an environment in an environmental crisis that for the first time threatens our very existence. More people died violent deaths in the 20th century than in the rest of history combined. And for the first time, the majority of those deaths were civilians. The last century was also the century of the Holocaust, the genocide, of climate change, of global poverty in the face of plenty, of moral collapse and social indifference. For the first time, we have the power to destroy the planet that is our home, our nest, our hive. Sixty years ago, President Eisenhower famously named the military-industrial complex. This diversified family farms made way to huge conglomerates producing a single crop of over thousands of acres using heavy machinery to spray noxious combinations of insecticides, herbicides, and fungicides, many of which were byproducts of, of toxins developed in the First World War to kill people. So these values are based on competition and fear, on a win-lose ratio, a control mindset using secrecy, conformity, obedience, with benefits and arbitrary freedom for a few. Its tradition was called a masculine paradigm. Most American teens can identify over 1,000 company logos but they can't identify 10 plants in their, back, in their backyard. Last year, for example, I took an observation hive to the arts and science evening of a local elementary school. One of the workers was nearing the end of her six weeks of life, and some of the children asked if they could hold her, so I held her in my hand. The girls could not wait to put out their hands and stroke her and hold her, and all the boys, without exception, pulled back in fear. What have we done? to distance our young men from the innocence and beauty of, of, of nature. You might have heard of the term natural deficit disorder. It refers to an idea by Richard Lwolf in a book called Last Child in the Woods. And he says human beings, especially children, are spending less time outdoors, resulting in a wide range of behavioral problems. He claims the causes of this are parental fears, restricted access to natural areas, and the lure of the computer screen and the TV. You may have seen a survey over the weekend that said that the average American spends two hours and 38 minutes on a cell phone, most of which is tied to apps, not to communicating with another human being. What I want to say to you is I believe that we are on the cusp or the tipping point of a new paradigm, and that managing honeybees is symbolic of one way of regaining what I feel is a sense of balance and proportion. And that's why I'm here this morning. For me, watching a colony of honeybees work suggests an alternative way of being. A colony is communal. Each worker has different tasks, and those tasks change during her short life. The purpose of what she does, and 97% of, of, of a hive is, is, is worker female bees, uh, the purpose of what these girls do is the well-being and survival of their community. Much like, I think, the rotary um, service about self. The satisfaction for a honeybee comes from contributing vitally to the greater whole. Indeed, if one part of the colony dies, they all die. So there's a vested interest in the, in the health of all. There's a word in Southern Africa called Ubuntu, and what it means is, I am because you are. Compare that with what Descartes said, which is the foundation of our Western society, I think, therefore I am. I think, therefore I am, versus I am because you are. Over millions of years, the honeybees have learned to adapt to the environment without need to control it. The colony displays very complex social and organizational behaviors without the need for any ruling body. 
The so-called queen is a misnomer. The Germans call her the mother bee. It's a much more accurate term. Um, she's really a very sophisticated egg-laying machine controlled by the workers. The behaviors in a honeybee colony are the result of cooperation among the bees correlated to available materials and energy. The whole is more than the sum of the parts, while at the same time, the needs of the whole determine the behavior of those parts. So this paradigm in the honeybee is one of cooperation based on openness and trust on a win-win nurturing mindset emphasizing teamwork and creativity. Benefits are mutual. Diversity is a strength to be celebrated. The earth is seen as a living organism of which we are a part and with which we interact, perhaps even a superorganism, which is the term used by a German author, Jürgen Tauss, to describe the honeybee colony. It's an ecological paradigm rather than an industrial paradigm. It's a partnership that involves cooperation, nurturing, mutual benefits, teamwork, openness, accountability, and believe it or not, peace. The tipping point affects not just Western civilization, but global existence as we are coming to understand it. Some are still in denial, continuing to believe in the old paradigm of separation and exp exploitation, and I can understand that. It's very easy to do. Others feel a deep need to live sustainably on this earth, to live in harmony with one another, feeling connected and alive, rather than fragmented and alone. So the shift I'm talking about is from attempting to control the world by any means possible to one respecting, caring for, and nurturing all beings that live here. For an increasing number of people, this search can be witnessed in the groundswell of care for a threatened aspect of nature, which in my case is the honeybee. And in the bigger picture, it reflects a deep yearning for an understanding of the natural world and of all the beings that increasingly populate it. Just as a good beekeeper works with the bees, so we must work with the world. Control has to give way to a more loving, more feminine approach, like the girls of the <coughs> elementary school who reached out to that dying bee. Once again, we need to understand, respect, rely upon, and trust the deep, inherent wisdom of nature. These are the same qualities that allow a colony of honeybees to survive and to be successful. Cooperation, interdependence rather than independence, communal decision making, and a society that balances individual needs with those of the colony. As a honeybee goes about her business using these traits, not so much as a leaf is disturbed, and indeed by the act of pollination, life itself is continued. So how can we do this? It actually is not difficult, but it depends on whether we choose to be proactive or reactive. Too often we choose to wait and be reactive, and in this case, that could be too late. And I think there are two main roads to the solution. The first is, I think we need to re redefine what we mean by quality of life, because the present criteria are unsustainable in the long term, especially with six billion people wanting to emulate the American lifestyle. <coughs> Continued quality of life will involve voluntary rest restraint, and I would like to believe that's going to be the theme of the 21st century, voluntary restraint. Secondly, if we had been meeting here 20 years ago, my wife Mary in fact spoke here 20 years ago, and someone in the room lit up a cigarette or a pipe, it would barely have been noticed. Today, it's unthinkable. The public revolution against smoking is remarkable, not least because it did not start in Washington, D.C. Rather, it began with a man in the street who voted with his wallet for smoke-free environments. It was grassroots activism at its finest, the great American tradition. Similarly, we need to increase awareness, especially through education, about environmental issues and the choices we have. Because all of us vote with our forks as often as three times a day. We're starting on the back foot. For example, as far as I can find out, not one of our middle or high schools in Europe has environmental studies as an integral part of its curriculum. So, finally, in conclusion, 
over the last 18 million years, honeybees have figured out a way to do the amazing things that they do. And how to take care of the place that's going to care for their offspring. Which means, in their case, having their genetic material operational 10,000 generations from now. And this means that we have to find new ways to do what we do without just destroying what gives us and the bees life and sustenance. Fortunately, there are millions of little geniuses willing to gift us with their best ideas. Let's have a conversation with them, because it might well determine the quality of life for our children and our grandchildren. Thank you. they'll be very cautious, and they will hum and they will hum. Part of the reason, I have to say, and, and this was said to me by a wonderful scientist from uh, Penn State after she'd had a glass of wine, <laughs> was that many of the chairs of research institutes and universities are funded by the companies, by the chemical companies like Monsanto and Bayer, and they're not going to bite the hand that feeds them. If you speak to a beekeeper, they will tell you almost without reservation that if we put our hives in an area where these pesticides are applied, the bees will die. It's happened again and again. And I would suggest to you that the Europeans are way ahead of us in this. They have banned the majority of these, of these pesticides. There are, France and California are roughly the same size. And there are as many bees in California as there are in France. In France, the bees are recovered. Almonds are, the, are Canada's, sorry, Canada, California's greatest course, source of cash. Bigger than tourism, bigger than the computer industry. 87% of the world's almonds come from California. Almonds are pollinated only by honeybees. It only takes 2 million colonies to pollinate the present crop. For the first time ever, last year, there were only 1.6 million colonies available to pollinate. And the beekeepers who were there say again and again, when my bees are exposed to the new generation, the neonicotinoids, pesticides, um, fungicides, herbicides, they will die. To make it worse, we, we can test and we do test the reaction of insects short term to each one of those. Do you know there are now 50 million registered chemicals worldwide? We have no idea how they interact. We have no idea how they synthesize. So I can spray compound A and compound B and no one knows what the synergy is between them. In some cases, the synergy is more than 1,000 times greater than either of those compounds alone. So my answer to your question as a beekeeper, absolutely. If I want to keep my bees alive, I have to protect them from what's happening around me. And I live in seven days. Jeremy, it's a follow-up question. I have a friend who lives in Vermont. He's an amateur beekeeper. And oddly enough, we spoke on the phone this morning. He has lost all his bees over the winter. And so he's devastated. He's been doing it maybe two or three years and he would be in a rural environment, is there anything he can do to help protect them the next time around? Because he's starting from scratch. Right. And the question is a phone call with the, the one beekeeper this morning who lost all his hives over winter. We're still very concerned about what caused this 50% winter loss nationwide. And it appears something happened in the fall. We're not quite certain what it is yet, we'll find out. 
it appears there were two things operating together. One was um, the bees coming out of the summer with the exposure to these very toxic elements. And the second bee that was introduced into this country from Africa in 1985, something called the Varroa mite. The, bi the biological term is Varroa destructor. And um, it doesn't kill the bee, but it lays eggs on the, on the pupa of the bee. Bees do not have red blood corpuscles, so they don't heal from wounds. So when the bee emerges from the pupa, it has this gaping wound all over them, which is an entry point for viruses and so on. And it, it would appear that the combination of pesticides and varroa formed a perfect storm for the first time last fall. And the bees went into the winter looking good, but in fact were fundamentally sick and healthy beyond our ability to, to see. So what do you do? What does he do? The first thing is the farmers around me, before they spray, they call me at night. And I keep my bees in the hives for three days, because that's when they're most volatile. Because it's, interesting, it's of the interest in the farmer to have the bees. He doesn't want them to die either. So first of all, there's a cooperation that exists. And secondly, we have to be much better at checking for, regulating, and treating varroa without chemicals. And that's part of the management. far more successful than rural beekeeping. A hundred years ago, there used to be a hive in almost every yard in Pennsylvania. And I'm told that in the old one-room schoolhouses, there was a required element of every curriculum for beekeeping because it was the kids who looked after the bees. When we moved from the town, from the countryside to the towns, we left the bees behind not realizing that their real value is pollination more than honey. The value of bees pollinating is 20 times greater that than the cell value of honey. We came into the um, countryside and there was this gradual increase in industrial farming, as, as I tried to describe. What's happening in the towns is that people are using less chemicals and fertilizers on their lawns and on their flowers, and there's a greater floral variety. As far as I know, the greatest concentration of hives in the world is in Vienna, Austria, an average of 34 hives per square mile in the city. And you've probably read about the hives on the top of skyscrapers in New York, on the Paris Opera House, on the Tate Gallery in London, in New York, the, the, high, the bees are flying down into, uh, into the, the gardens, into uh, Central Park, and they're going back, and they're flourishing. And of course, most famous one now is the, uh, is the hive on the, on the border of the White House, um, which I believe is called Bee Force One. 